This morning's message is going to be a little bit different. Last Sunday we uh, launched a little mini-series entitled How to Change, or the times that are changed, and we looked at all the things that have changed since the year 2000, the turn of the new millennium, and uh, all the stuff that's happened since then that has been a surprise to many, many people, has been massive changes just in a 22 year span in technology, we looked at last week, business, social issues, family structure, education, uh, terminology that we use has changed dramatically and continues to change and also changes in Christianity. There's been a great decline in uh, Christianity in the United States over the last 23 years especially. Um, our culture, our society has changed amazingly over this period of time. And, uh, we're talking about things that we never thought we would probably talk about at least 22 years ago. And further back, say 50 years, wasn't even on the radar that we talk about these things. So this morning I want us to continue this discussion by pondering the question, if you were going to change a culture, how would you go about it? How would you do it? If you want to change a society from being what it was to being what it is, how would you tackle that, that, uh, that issue? Well, I want to tell you how I would do it, okay? So this is what I would do if I wanted to change a culture. Uh, I just want to say right at the beginning that this is a kind of facetious look at things. So this, I don't have a plan to take over. So just so you know, right? but this is what I would do if that was the case. So you might be better buckle up because you're going to be bumpy a little bit, I think. First thing I would do is control the educational system. Gotta start with the kids, right? Gotta start there. After all, they're the next generation and the generation after that. Uh, change their way of thinking and you change the culture, eventually, in time. After all, they're gonna become the industry leaders, they're gonna become the politicians, they're gonna be the religious leaders of the future, right? So, change their thinking now. Remember a guy called uh, Vladimir Lenin? Ever heard of that guy? Um, you know who he is. Len is thought to have said one of two things. People are not quite sure whether he said one or the other. One quote he's attributed to is, give me four years to teach children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Conversely, he says something like this, give us the child for eight years and it will forever be a Bolshevik. That's a socialist communist. Basically, indoctrinate them, they'll grow up exactly the way you want them to grow up, to be good socialists in that system. If I can plant ideas in their mind before they're able to make rational decisions from themselves, and of course everybody knows that the frontal cortex is not fully formed until you're actually 21. And so you sow some ideas out there, and guess what? They'll believe it probably for the rest of their life, unless something radical happens to them and gets them to change their mind. So what else would I want to do if I was going to control that? Well, I'd want to control the who, the where, and the what's of education. Wouldn't you want to do that? That's what I would do. Who's going to educate the kids? Where's that going to happen, and where's it not going to happen? And what's going to be taught? So now you have a closed system of where, who, and what. To keep control, I would have to not allow parents to get involved, because they'll just muddy the waters with their ideologies. Got to have a central system. I would only appoint teachers who held to my worldview. I wouldn't allow parents to have a choice on where their kids should be educated. It's got to be in certain places by certain people. And I certainly wouldn't allow parents to have a voice on what was taught to their kids. In fact, you know, it's funny this because there's a verse in the Bible that keeps coming into my mind as I'm trying to reorganize society. And that's that verse that says, oh yeah, train up a child the way it should go and when it's old it will not depart from it. Maybe some people out there who are not religious people are smarter than we are. Just a thought. And that's only dealing with elementary education. That's not dealing with high school, college, grad school. I'd want to make sure that that whole scenario was festooned with those who held to my particular viewpoint. Second thing I would do is remove or weaken certain authority structures. You'd want to do that. You'd want to marginalize like the police because they're, you know, sometimes can be a problem. And certainly you'd want to deal with parental authority. You can't have that. 
If you're going to have a closed system, if you're going to control the system, then you can't have other people speaking out of it. So, I'd empower the kids to make choices for themselves. I mean, they don't need to tell mom and dad, do they? Of course they don't, because we're dealing with them as little adults now. I would also change probably what you call mom and dad, because that would lessen their authority, so they're no longer mom and dad. They're, let me see, let's call them like gestational parents. Or let's call them non-gestational parents or birthing parents. And, you know, of course we have to change all the country songs that were ever written, but never the last one. You see, words of influence, words of power, words of meaning. What you say takes an effect. And if you say it long enough and loud enough, guess what? People will believe it. Even when it's not true. Because it sounds true. So what's the third thing I would change? The third thing I would change was uh, the meaning of words. I changed some meanings of words and introduced new terminologies that will bamboozle, confuse a whole bunch of people. Um, I would do this to lessen the stigma of some of these words in some groups in society, and some people in society. You know, the first thing I would immediately ban, I would immediately ban that phrase that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's just offensive and annoying, so I'm going to get rid of that because it's not true. So, let's change some words. So instead of uh, stealing or theft, let's call it uh, misappropriation of funds. That sounds better, doesn't it? Misappropriation of funds. Adultery is not adultery anymore, it's having an affair. Being homosexual is not homosexual anymore, even though it's a medical term. Uh, it's a gay lifestyle, so let's call it that. Uh, an illegal immigrant, let's call them undocumented workers. Uh, inmates, you can't call them inmates, they're stigmatizing. They are incarcerated persons. Convicts are people convicted of a crime. A juvenile delinquent, you can't call them that because that stigmatizes them. They are, but they are children at risk. And people who are promiscuous are not promiscuous anymore, they are sexually liberated. And when people come along and, and, and don't go with that kind of terminology, then let's label that bunch uh, people who use hate speech. Let's kind of package that whole group in the hate speech. Or intolerant, or bigoted, or blank, phobic, or maybe they're even racist, who knows? I would also introduce a whole bunch of new terminologies that a lot of people don't understand. Things like cultural appropriation. Um, intersectionality, you all know what that means, right? Uh, gender fluidity, uh, equity, microaggression, and I think God, there's about 100 words I would introduce so that new concepts were wrapped in great terminology. The latest one I'd probably use uh, is the one called Christian nationalism. That's an interesting one. I think I'll label some people with that because that would kind of set them in a particular box. Next thing I would do in my scheme to take over is I would marginalize everyone who stands in the way of progress. I call them radicals, or extremists, or a threat to democracy, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, these are people who are standing in the way of progress. Their ideas are old, they're outdated, they're, they don't apply to modern society. And if any group continues to stand against my ideas, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to muzzle them. I'm going to cancel them. So they won't have a voice. Boycott, do what I need to do. I'm going to make sure they can't play a significant part in society that I'm trying to build anymore. Next thing I would do is I'd control the population. The unfortunate thing is I have to live in a constitutional republic. That's a bummer. It really is. Too bad it wasn't just a democracy, because then I could get one way. But we have to vote in fact, you know, like congregationalists. So we've got to vote in fact all the time. And I can't get around that. So what could I do? What could I, how could I guarantee that I'm always in office, that I always get elected, that my way of things become the norm? Well, I'd make sure that the populist was a majority for me. I'd stack the deck to make sure I'd never get voted out of office. 
and control what people hear, what they see, what they think, what they believe. Probably could do that mm, through the media. That would work. So that my ideas are promulgated over the airwaves. And by repeating things again and again and again that may not be true, but maybe are the things that people want to hear. I could go on and on and on, but this is all fiction on my part. I'm making it up for me. But think about where we are. Think about what you watch. Think about what you read. My job as a pastor, as a shepherd of the flock, is to guard and protect. It's not just to preach cozy sermons on a Sunday. It's to inform, hopefully, and to protect spiritually the people who are under my charge. And that includes everything. If all we spoke to was Bible verses, then we'd be missing what's going on around us. And so if I had a message to the church, not just this one, it would be the same message that a lot of pastors, unfortunately not as many as I like, are now saying to their congregations. And it's simply two words. Wake up. Just wake up. See what's going on. Don't be an ostrich with your head in the sand. Thinking it'll all, all work out. Well, the rapture will come soon. It'll be out of here next couple of months. That may not happen. I wish it would. It may not. So the question is, should any of this be a surprise to any of us? And the answer is no, it shouldn't be if we read our Bible. It shouldn't be a surprise at all. So let me read a few texts from the scriptures that tell us it shouldn't be a surprise. Romans 1, verses 18 through 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Truth is not important anymore. It's what we feel is important. It's what we think is important. And apparently the truth has been silent. I'm talking about even biological truth. There's now been sidelined for the way that we feel. Paul goes on to say, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile. In their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Isaiah 5, verses 20 says this, Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Now think about that for a minute. Think about the last 22 years. That which we would have said would be evil, or wrong, or unrighteous, or sinful, call it what you will, is now being propagated as being good, as being righteous, as being something that's We're going to talk about some of the big issues in the next couple of weeks, but I did read a book the other day by a United Church of Christ lady pastor uh, that was a biblical defense, defense of abortion. This is about the worst written book I've ever read in my whole life, and it's easily dismantled. But nevertheless, here we have a quote, religious leader. I'm not using the word Christian. A religious leader who is propagating something that's contrary to the word of God. Then 2 Timothy chapter 3 really nails it. Remember, when Paul writes these words, he's writing from a prison cell in Rome about to face death for the gospel. He's instructing his young pastor, Timothy, in Ephesus, his disciple, to uh, keep on keeping on in the light of difficulties that he's facing in the church there, uh, persecution and various things. This is what he says. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be, and here's the list, and you, and you check the boxes. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's a quite a long list of what we see today. Then in Matthew 24, Jesus, as he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, speaks to his disciples and says these words. He says, in the last days, nation will rise against nation. He says, you'll be hated for my name's sake by all nations. And then in verse 12, he says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We're seeing that clearly in this nation, that lawlessness is on the rise. And the love of many, he's talking about Christians, will grow cold. People will submit, people will give up, people will bow to the culture rather than stand on the Word of God. So we need to ask ourselves, is this all happening by chance or by happenstance? Or do you think there's something else going on? Well, I can tell you very clearly there's something else going on. We may or may not identify a human person or a human agency behind all of this. And I'm certain of this. There definitely is someone behind it all, ultimately. And his name is not so, this is safe. That's where it comes from. That is the person who's trying to uproot everything that we hold dear as Christian people. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes not for it, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Then Jesus said, But I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And then Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, says these words, which reminds us of the, of the ultimacy of the foe that we face. He says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We have an enemy of our soul who wants us to be destroyed, that we need to stand against. So our battle is not simply against political ideology or any kind of ideologies. It's ultimately a battle of kingdoms, of domains, the kingdom of God and Satan's dominion. The Bible says he's the ruler of the power of the air. But this world belongs to our God. So what should our response be as Christians? I mean, what can we do about all of this? I mean, I'm, 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 you know, I'm just a single, singular person. I mean, I've got a small rural church. I mean, what can, what can we do to influence or to change or be involved in the process? How can I make a difference? I've been asked that question a million times. Christians want to get involved. Well, two ways as a citizen you can vote. That's what we do. Your vote counts the same as anybody else's. Let me say something about voting, because people I've had so many Christians come to me and ask advice about how should I vote? Well, I don't tell people how to vote, I tell them one simple thing. Don't vote your conscience. Because your conscience changes. Your conscience can be even seared. It can be, you know, some people go around with no conscience at all. So our conscience is not a perfect guide. So when somebody asks me how they should vote, I say, vote the values of the kingdom of God. Vote the values of the kingdom of God. Vote according to the word of God. So why should we do that? Well, we are citizens of heaven first before we were citizens of the United States. There's a great movie that was uh, shot many years ago. Robert Shaw, I think, was uh, played Henry VIII. And it was the story of Sir Thomas Moore. And Sir Thomas Moore was a, a prominent, he was Chancellor, I do believe, of England at the time. And he was a prominent Catholic. And if you know your history, uh, Henry VIII uh, had an argument with the Pope uh, over the annulment of his marriage. And the Pope would not relent, and so Henry launched what would become the Church of England, uh, separated from the Church of Rome. But Sir Thomas More remained a staunch Catholic. He would not say or criticize the king throughout the whole process. But because Moore would not relent and agree with Henry VIII, 
Henry VIII had him executed. The Tower of London chopped his head off. And Sir Thomas More was on the scaffold awaiting execution. This is what he said. He said, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. That should be all of our approaches. We may be the servant of this wonderful nation called the United States. We may be loyal to the Constitution of the United States. But like Sir Thomas More, we need to say, we may be the Constitution's good servant, but we are God's first. Let me remind you that there would be no United States as we know it if it wasn't for those believers back in England who decided to, to leave and come and live in a place where they could have free expression of their faith, their faith in Christ. As a citizen you can vote, as a Christian you can pray. That God would sovereignly intervene in our nation. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So we can pray. And we can also take a stand. And my encouragement to you is know the issues, know what you're talking about, know how to respond to people who have an opposing opinion. And by the way, at, uh, this whole season at uh, Refuel, Wednesday nights at Compass Outreach Centre in Greeley, that's what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about how to equip the saints for the work of ministry, including how to defend your faith against those who are in opposition, how to do it properly. My final word is this. Don't compromise. There was a phrase that came out years and years ago. It was called, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Don't give a, don't give an inch. Because the Lord's on our side. We're going to look at two of the biggest uh, moral issues over the next two Sundays. I don't do this a lot. I did this about 10 years ago, 2004 I think it was, in my church in Austin. Uh, because people came and asked, you know, what do we do in the light of everything that's going on? And of course, back in 2004, it wasn't quite as critical as that. And this is kind of what I said to them. Dare to be a dad. Don't give up. Don't buckle under. Stand strong. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are at a critical juncture in our nation's history. Lord, it's easy for us just to sit on sidelines and watch it all happen and wait in the rapture. But I don't believe that's your, your plan for your people. Lord, through the history of this church, the Church of Jesus, we've taken a stand on many issues. And it's cost a lot. There are people, there are those who have given their lives for the cause of freedom, for the cause of Christ. And Father, we don't know whether that's going to be something that's required in this nation. But we need to be willing to do that, to be able to die God's good servant. Help us, Lord, to take a stand. Help us to pray. Help us, Lord, not to shrink back. But help us, Lord, to know the issues and to be able to pray effectively and to speak effectively to each one of them. Father, help us, we pray. Help us, Lord, not to be in despair or panic, but, Lord, uh, to move on with confidence, knowing that the God who is with us is always greater than the enemy will ever face. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.